Um, welcome to the uh, second uh, installment of the 2010-2011 NYU Reynolds Social Entrepreneurship in the 21st Century Speaker Series. Uh, my name is Gabriel Bradbaugh. I'm the director of the NYU Reynolds program. Uh, and I'm also someone who's been really very deeply impressed by Martin Fisher's work and uh, the work of his organization, Kickstart. Uh, I think that the, the impact that they've had in poverty alleviation in East Africa serve as a great example of how to make that often very difficult transition from having a great idea to actual, real, meaningful, sustainable, uh, and scalable impact. The Kickstart story to me is, is really a story about having a great theory of change and having a really great system for effectively implementing that theory of change. And I think we're going to learn a lot about that journey tonight. Before I formally uh, uh, welcome him to the podium, I just want to take a quick minute and, uh, and let you know a little bit about the Reynolds program. Uh, the Reynolds program attracts, trains, encourages, and funds graduate and undergraduate students from across the university who want to become the next generation of social entrepreneurs. And so you may be asking yourself, what's a social entrepreneur? Well, this is a Reynolds event, so I'd like to think maybe you are one, or you're sitting next to one, or you, you, know, you hope to be one. The short version is a social entrepreneur is somebody who figures out new ways to solve old problems. And they do so ideally in ways that attack the root cause of the problem and not just the symptoms. So what do I mean by that? A social entrepreneur that's concerned with a broken foster care system doesn't simply start a great new foster care agency, although that's really important work. Rather, that social entrepreneur is going to figure out ways to improve outcomes in measurable ways for foster care clients across the entire system. Or a social entrepreneur that's concerned about sick people isn't simply going to get doctors into countries where they're badly needed. Rather, that social entrepreneur might create a new cell phone network so many doctors in remote corners of the globe can share life-saving information about their patients. And a social entrepreneur that's concerned about poverty in places like post-earthquake Haiti or Ghana or other regions doesn't simply try to funnel more aid into the region. Rather, those social entrepreneurs are going to figure out ways to create real business opportunities so people can lift themselves out of poverty. And these are all things that Reynolds Fellows and Scholars are currently working on now. And some folks come to the Reynolds program to turn ideas like that into reality and do so in ways that are sustainable and scalable. Other people come to the Reynolds program because they want to build the infrastructure that's needed for those ideas to really take root and flourish. So these are the lawyers that are going to create the new legal entity that social entrepreneurship needs, or the finance folks that are going to help ensure there's capital available for social entrepreneurial investments, or MIS folks that are going to help build the databases so we can have affordable, accurate, utilizable social return on investment calculations that really get utilized to value a company. And then a third type of change maker comes to the Reynolds program because they want to spur others to meaningful action through media and the arts. So I'm talking about the documentary filmmakers, the artists, uh, the authors, and the journalists. There was actually a piece recently in the uh, last Sunday's op-ed where Nicholas Kristof uh, was talking about some issues around rating charitable organizations. Sometimes Nicholas Kristof is that third type of, of social entrepreneur. Probably the best example that many people here would be familiar with would be David Bornstein, who wrote the book How to Change the World. Um, so if this sounds like you, sounds like somebody you know, I very much encourage you to learn more about our program. Uh, you can visit us on our website. You can join our Facebook page. You can follow us on Twitter. You could subscribe to our podcast channel. Uh, all our contact info is in the brochure that you got when you came in. Um, so now to uh, uh, the reason we are uh, uh, all here tonight, I'm really pleased to be able to, um, to formally welcome Martin. Uh, Martin is an engineer by training and has spent the better part of his career focused on one thing, trying to list, lift millions of people out of poverty and do it quickly, cost effectively, and sustainably. And everything he does is guided by a very basic premise, and it's this. A poor person's biggest need is a way to make money. And his approach is really disarmingly simple. Develop new technologies that local entrepreneurs can use to create their own successful, profitable, small-scale enterprises. 
And the big secret here is it looks like this really works. Since Kickstart was founded in 1991, it was then called Aprotech, over 104,000 new businesses have been created using Kickstart technologies. Each year, those businesses generate about $102 million in profit and new wages, which has led to an estimated something like 72,000 new jobs. Collectively, that's lifted an estimated 500,000 people out of poverty. In Kenya alone, the annual revenue that's produced by Kickstart Technologies is equal to six-tenths of 1% of the entire country's GDP. So what's the big secret here? Why has Kickstart been so successful? I personally think it has something to do with this very kind of robust and methodical approach that they take to problem solving. And we'll learn more about that tonight. I also think it has something to do with how transparent they are. They're brutally honest with themselves and the public about what works and what doesn't. And they're also very transparent about the process that they use when they enter a new area, a new geographic region. And it's very simple. Identify an opportunity, develop a technology, develop a supply chain, create the market, and then assess, reassess, and assess some more, and after that, do some more assessments. Uh, I know we're all excited to learn uh, more directly from Martin, so please join me in uh, warmly welcoming him. Thank you so much. Hey, great. Thanks a lot, Gabriel. And uh, thanks to all of you for coming out. Um, it's great to be here. And I am I'm going to tell you the story of Kickstart and tell you a lot of the stories that we've learned and uh, lessons that we've learned along the way. And it's quite a long story, and so I'm going to talk a little bit fast <laughs> and fit a lot in. Um, it all started for me back when I was in graduate school. And in my family, it's a very academic family, and you sort of need a PhD in physics just to qualify for the family. And so there I was, plugging away. I was doing a PhD in mechanical engineering, but I was doing it in a physics lab, so I would almost make it. <laughs> And uh, I realized about two-thirds of the way through my PhD that I was really educating myself into a corner. The more education I had, the less I was really qualified to do. And I was suddenly uniquely qualified to either go and try to teach at a university, which I didn't really think I knew much to teach, <clears throat> or I could go work for big oil, or I could do military research. And none of that really excited me very much. And so I went off to Peru and went trekking in the mountains and tried to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. And that was the first time I really came across rural poverty. And I thought, well, maybe I should take a little bit of time out of this career and see if there's anything that can happen between the intersection between technology and poverty. Is there anything that could be done? So I came back and I applied for a Fulbright Fellowship to go to Peru. And uh, they told me, well, the only problem is you don't speak Spanish. So you're not going to Peru. And so literally two days before the applications were due, I, I flipped through the catalog and said, well, I could get a Fulbright to go to Kenya. They, they, they speak English there. <laughs> And uh, I did apply and got lucky enough to get that and went down to Kenya for 10 months. Um, and I stayed down there for 17 years. So that was in 1985. And of course, Kenya, as we all know, is in sub-Saharan Africa, which really is the world's very, very poorest place. Um, the statistics are, are bad. 40% of the people go to bed hungry. 45% live on less than a dollar a day. And that statistic is always a little surprising to me because actually these people are living, most of them, on more like you know, 15, 20 cents a day um, per person. So when it says less than a dollar a day, a dollar a day is actually pretty good if you can get a dollar a day per person. Um, and uh, most of them are much poorer. And the other pretty shocking statistic in Africa, of course, is that most of the people are less than 20 years old. And that's just a huge time bomb. And it's getting poorer, downward spiral. We're seeing a lot of failed states in Africa. So it's a tough place to be. So I went, and I thought, well, I'll get tied into the appropriate technology movement. There was a guy called Schumacher who wrote a very famous book called Small is Beautiful back in the 70s. And everybody got very excited about small scale technology was going to save the world. And I said, I'm going to go jump right in and, and join that movement for a year and uh, you know, learn something and contribute something. Well, I got to Kenya, and I discovered that virtually nobody was doing anything. Everybody said, oh, we did that. It failed. We've moved on to the next big thing. We're not interested. Go away. And I said, OK, I don't know. I'm an engineer. It seems to me maybe technology has something to offer. And I found one small group at ActionAid, 
which was doing something with technology. And what they were doing is they were building low-cost buildings and designing low-cost um, technologies for construction and training people to build with them. And so I started out and joined that group. And when I was there, I met this guy here called Nick Moon. And uh, Nick and I went on and have worked together ever since. Um, and Nick's background, he was a carpenter who was training people how to build low-cost schools. Um, so I ended up joining ActionAid, which is where Nick was working. And I worked with them for the next five years. And I did all sorts of things. I went out and said, well, poor people need uh, clean water. Let me set up a large rural water program. And I set up a very large one, one of the biggest ones in Kenya. And we put in wells, and we built dams, and we put in pumps. Um, we did all sorts of things that you do in water programs. Um, and then we built some rural workshops, and we mass-produced farm equipment. He gave it away to farmers for free, so plows and harrows that are drawn by oxen. And then we worked with youth groups and women's groups and, and trained them to start small businesses. Now, all of this stuff sounds pretty good, and all of this stuff is actually very, very typical in development. It's what people do in development. The only challenge is, the only problem is, this stuff really doesn't work very well. And so you go into a village, you dig a well, you donate a nice shiny pump on the well, Everybody gets very excited. They have nice, clean water right there. And for a couple of years, everybody has access to nice, clean water in the village. You come back about three or four years later, and the pump is broken down, and nobody fixes it, and everybody goes back to the way they were working before. And Africa is littered with between 50 and 100,000 broken down water points. Nonetheless, we continue to put them in there. So what's happening here? The problem is it's sort of the tragedy of the commons, right? I don't own it. Why should I fix it? You don't own it. Why should you fix it? No ownership, nobody's going to take responsibility. Um, giving farm equipment away to farmers sounds like a good thing to do. The only problem is it's not really the equipment they wanted, um, so they don't really appreciate it. But much worse than that, there's a guy down the road trying to produce equipment and sell it. And we put him out of business. Um, and then three years later, when the money runs out, there's no farm equipment in the local area. Again, very typical story. Working with youth groups and women's groups to get into small businesses, again, it sounds like a great idea. But as long as we're there holding their hands, yes, they work. The minute we walk away from these groups, they're not real entrepreneurial. They're not really entrepreneurs. They were formed just to get the help from us. Um, the whole group falls apart. And uh, again, there's an entrepreneur down the road who wanted to do the business who couldn't compete. I mean, the best thing that used to happen, it happened once or twice, was somebody would steal the equipment, one of the group members, and go start their own business. And of course, we would call him a thief. But in fact, they were the only entrepreneur that we had. Um, <laughs> And so this stuff really didn't work very well. And I spent five years doing this and, and, and looking and learning lessons. And, and like I said, we learned a bunch of lessons. Um, individually, individual or family ownership works best. Um, the tragedy of the commons happens when you have group ownership. It's better if you sell products to people, not giving them away. Why? Because giveaways really are not fair. Deciding who to get one is very difficult to do. It's actually not cheap. It's difficult to go out and give things away. You think about it for a moment. You've got to set up distribution networks. It's not sustainable, of course. It's not fully utilized by the person. They don't really appreciate it. It hurts the private sector. It creates dependency. It damages dignity. Now, you know, there are times when you need to give things away in the case of relief or in the case of public health. In certain instances, it does make sense. But generally, I went over to Kenya as a socialist, really wanted to go and help and do something good, and came away after a few years as sort of a small C capitalist, and said, OK, we're actually going to sell people things. The other thing I learned is that almost nothing is taken to scale. There's so many experiments going on in Africa. Little things, even things that work, are just little things that work. They don't get blown up to anything. But the most important lesson I learned is that, sounds so obvious, but that everybody there lives in a cash economy, just like us. They need money for everything. However poor they are, they need money to buy food, to buy farm inputs, for clothing, shelter, cooking, fuel, even cooking pots, education, health care, transport, communication, lighting, water and sanitation. They need money for everything. A poor person just like us, they can't do anything without money. Um, and in fact, if you think about it, the number one need of a poor person anywhere in the world is actually a way to make more money. Now, they are making a little bit of money, but they're not making enough. Now, it wasn't always this way. Um, it turns out, um, before the Cold War finished in Africa, we were dumping so much money to these not very nice dictators um, and between us and the ex-Soviet Union that they basically provided free health care, free education to people, and on top of that, highly subsidized essential commodities like cooking oil and tea and sugar. On top of that, the farm sizes were pretty big back then. And you could grow food on your farm. You could go into the forest. You could cut down the trees. You could go hunting. You could live a subsistence life, educate your kids with the free education and health care. Um, 
and life wasn't so bad. But at the end of the Cold War, everything drastically changed. We cut back the aid to Africa by a factor of 10. We brought in structural adjustment. All of a sudden, you had to pay for healthcare, education, no more subsidized foods. At the same time, the population was doing this. The farm sizes were shrinking like this. The forest was cut down. Um, all of a sudden, people were thrown into a real cash economy where they needed a way to make money. And this happened not only in Africa, but it happened all over the world. Um, Ex-Soviet Union, it happened in China. Um, and really, in the world, we actually need to create about 1.5 billion jobs. And in my mind, this is really the biggest problem in the world. It's the world's most urgent problem. And if you look at Africa, the formal private sector is really not the solution. Yes, it's creating some jobs, but very few. You know, 7% of the labor force in Kenya works in the formal private sector. You know, 3.5% in Tanzania. And even in India, it's only 10%. So what is the solution? Well, the solution is the people. People are very poor, but they're very entrepreneurial and very hardworking. They really have to be to survive. Um, you can't live for a day without some access to money, so people find a way to do it. And you can see this because the informal sector is absolutely booming. And it's happened about that same time. Suddenly, the informal sector took off. What's the informal sector where people are mainly doing petty trade? They move into the cities. They start buying and selling things on the side of the road. Um, but if you look at petty trade, you look at um, carpentry, metalwork, tailoring, and food preparation, you have about 98% of the businesses in the informal sector. People, people are making a little bit of money, but they're not making enough money to get out of poverty. They're not actually looking for handouts. They're looking for opportunities. And the reason they're not making enough money actually is because they're in the wrong business. They're all competing with each other because it's very hard for a very poor person to come up with a new business idea. Um, you know, they don't have a lot of education, a lot of exposure. How do you come up with that great new business idea? And even if they do have a great new business idea, it's very hard, actually almost impossible, for them to access the tools and the equipment they need to make that business viable. Equipment that's affordable to buy, affordable to use, and profitable to use. It's simply not available. Certainly not available in that little village. In fact, not available anywhere in the world, you discover. Um, so we figured if we could solve these problems, um, we could really help people. So Nick and I told people at ActionAid we really didn't believe what we were doing was making much sense, and we wanted to do something different. We were soon asked to leave ActionAid um, <laughs> and fired. And we said, OK, well, <laughs> maybe that's the best thing. Um, we will do what you want for the next six months, and meanwhile, we'll try to start a new organization. And we went out and started something called Aprotech, and we got a matching grant from the British to do this. And it's now called Kickstart. We changed the name later. Our mission, take millions of people out of poverty and change the way development is done. And as you've heard, we do this by developing and mass marketing very low-cost equipment that poor entrepreneurs buy and use to start new businesses. Now, that's great, but we got a matching grant from the British, which means there's nothing to match it with. At the beginning, we matched it with our salaries, meaning we didn't get paid. That gave us a little bit of money to hire a few other people, but you don't go very far that way. Um, and then there was an opportunity. There was a major refugee crisis in Somalia in the early 90s. And about 350,000 people poured over the border into northern Kenya. Now, northern Kenya is a desert. Um, and these people, as refugees, had to be looked after. And in a refugee camp, you go in, you have to feed people, you have to put people in tents, um, you have to give them water. Um, it's a huge, um, amazing amount of infrastructure that goes on into a refugee camp. And any of you have get a chance to visit one, it's really worth it, because it's an amazing thing. Um, but the Somali refugees were unique in the history of the refugees and the history of UNHCR in that they refused to use a communal toilet. Um, now, this makes sense because they were mainly nomadic people, and you don't go to the toilet where someone else went to the toilet. Now, normally in a refugee camp, you put in a communal toilet and people share it. You know, a few hundred people share it. That wasn't happening. The whole desert here was turning into a sewer, and it was a big problem. Now, we'd been playing around with a very low-cost technology for making a very cheap toilet, a very low-cost pit latrine. Basically, it looks like this. It's a concrete slab with no reinforcing in it. It's domed, and so it's very strong. You can mass produce these things at very low cost, only three quarters of a bag of cement, no steel in them. Anyway, we talked to UNHCR, and we ended up with a small subcontract to put in 4,000 toilets as an experiment, and we ended up doing about 45,000 toilets, and then we ended up training all the other agencies and doing over 100,000 pit latrines. Now, this was a UNHCR con contract, which is worth multiple millions of dollars, and when you work for UNHCR, you can charge a small percentage on top, about 5%. We took that 5% and we matched it with the money we got from the British. 
And we said, okay, now we can actually do what we want to do, which is not technology for relief, because there is a need for that also, but technology for development. And we rented a place in, in the edge of a slum in Nairobi, in Kariobangi, and we have a small works up there and some small offices um, right on the back of the sewage, the main sewage uh, in Nairobi, right behind this building, a very smelly area. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and that was great, but technologies for development, what kind of technologies are we talking about? Um, what kind of technology can take people out of poverty? So it must make money. People's number one need is a way to make money, we've said, right? So it has to make money for the user. We don't need labor-saving devices. We don't need time-saving devices. Most poor people have a lot of time and a lot of labor. They're not going to pay to save or labor or time. The opportunity cost of their labor or time is pretty small. They only want to make money. So it has to be a money-making technology. Now, how about a money-saving technology? Well, if you don't have a lot to save, you're not going to spend much on a money-saving technology. You'll spend a little bit, but not much. And I always think the right price for a money-saving technology is the price of a chicken. Now, now, why the price of a chicken? Because any family anywhere in the world, however poor they are, can afford to buy one chicken per year to eat as a treat. So that's the kind of excess money that a family can come up with once in a while. So for a money-saving technology, like an efficient stove or you know, a solar light lantern or something like that, it has to be really cheap because it's not actually making money. But if they're going to spend more, it has to actually make money for people. But it must be affordable because people are pretty poor. Now, $20 is something anyone can almost afford. Up to $400 is a little more expensive. But for the right technology, people can afford it. And of course, it has to have a very profitable business model with very quick cost recovery because you can't get a loan. And I always talk about farm time. People are used to putting their money in the ground for three to six months when you plant a crop and then getting it back three to six months later. So it has to have a cost recovery that quickly. So what kind of businesses could those be? Well, it turns out there's, turns out there's a lot of businesses, but, but these businesses have to also serve the local market. Why is that? Because if you're very poor, you're living in the slum, or you're living in the rural area, you're not suddenly going to be starting to export to New York, right? You're not suddenly even going to be starting to sell into Nairobi if you live in northern Kenya. You don't even know the place, right? So if you're going to start a business, you better have local customers, at least initially. Right? Now, the best businesses are something that you can start with a local customer and then go to the bigger city customer and then maybe get to export. But when you're thinking about this, you really want to start with a local business. So that means you're going to be selling products and services to the poor because your neighbors are poor. Well, what do the poor buy and sell? What do the, what do the poor need? What do they buy? Well, guess what? We just made a nice list of all the things that the poor buy. Right? They buy food, they buy fire inputs, they buy clothing, they buy shelter, fuel. All these things are bought by the poor. So your businesses had better provide some of these things to the poor. Um, and uh, many possible business opportunities. There's a big, long list. And some surprising opportunities, because if you do your market research, you find out that the poor pay very high prices for everything they buy. So that means there's all sorts of opportunities to sell them things which are cheaper and still make a good margin. Everything from money, they pay a high price for money. That's why microcredit works, right? Even in microfinance, they pay a lot. Um, food, electricity, light, communication, they buy things in small quantities and pay very high prices. Um, the poor pay for bad quality products and services. They buy terrible stuff. So you can have better products. Everything from healthcare to education to water construction. There's all sorts of opportunities there. The poor get paid very little for their products. When they produce something and they try to sell it, they don't get a whole lot of money for it. Well, opportunities there. You could have grain banks, you could have marketing services, and you improved on new products, teach them how to make new products, right? Um, you can compete with existing products. You can avoid packaging and transport. Um, so things like cooking oil, which otherwise are made you know, with the same seeds that you have locally in the rural area, go to the city and come back as cooking oil, you can make it locally. Farm inputs, cosmetics, you can make these things locally. Um, you can have leapfrog technologies, cell phones, solar, LEDs. The poor are also very cash flow constrained. This is the poor's number one problem, is they don't have a lot of money at any one time. Right? So again, new business models have to be thought about. Credit, layaway, franchises, services instead of products people pay for. You know, so they pay a little bit at a time, pay as you use, prepaid, like with cell phones. Right? So there's a ton of possible businesses that poor people can start to sell to other poor people. You just got to figure out what they are. Um, other quick lessons about designing things for the poor. They need 
require and deserve very high quality design and engineering. Just because someone's poor, don't give them something which you or I wouldn't use, <laughs> which doesn't work effectively, that they have to, to piece together with rubber bands. <laughs> Mass produce whatever you're making in a large factory because it's got to be high quality. It's got to be able to go to scale. Distribute and sell it through the private sector so that spare parts are locally available. It's cost effective, it's sustainable, and all the incentives are aligned with people. And mass market it. You can use labor intensive mass marketing because guess what? Labor is pretty cheap and people need jobs. Right? So we can, if you look at America back in the 50s, so a lot of labor intensive marketing and sales methods, a lot of those actually make sense in Africa still. So what kind of technology? So here's a, one of the first things we started with, a machine for making very strong building blocks from soil and cement. Take soil, tiny bit of cement, compress it, high pressure block. This particular guy here was a farmer. He lived on a, about an acre of land in Western Kenya. He saw one of these machines, he ended up saving up his money, bought one machine, ended up with four machines, 45 employees. Today he has a shopping mall in Nairobi, he's a wealthy man. We never met this guy, we never gave him anything. All we did is make the right technology locally available. We got a few thousand people started that business. Um, here's a machine for making cooking oil from sunflower seeds. You take sunflower seed, you put it in, you bring the handle up and down, you get two products, nice clean cooking oil and a nice animal feed on the side. Um, and very profitable business. Uh, this woman was a school teacher. She had two daughters. She was a single mom. She wanted to send her daughters to university. She knew she could never do that on her $40 a month salary. Um, so she saved up with her brother, bought this machine, employed two young men, contracted 20 farmers to grow sunflower, um, today, both her daughters have graduated from university. And now she's bought land, she uh, sells oil and animal feed all across the community. Again, a couple thousand businesses doing that. Um, baling hay, another great, um, turns out to be a great business. Um, why? Because if you grow hay, um, you can't transport unless you can bale it, because transporting big piles of hay doesn't work. And why do people want hay? Because people have very small plots of land, they have cattle that they want to use for milk. That means you have to zero graze the cow, and so you can milk it so it doesn't graze all over your place, and that means you need to feed it, it means you need to buy hay, you need to feed it. Well, unless you can bale hay, you can't sell it, so bale hay bale. Um, there's a lot of ideas. Um, but what business can your average African start? Now, 80% of the poor in Africa, and in fact, one third of the people in the world, one third of all the people in the world, are small scale farmers. They live on half an acre of land, one acre, two acres of land, sometimes in Africa, even an eighth acre of land. Right? They have one asset, a little plot of land, one basic skill farming. What business can they start? Well, it turns out that we have to solve that problem because that's where the poverty exists, and the best business that they can start is to start irrigating and doing irrigated agriculture. Right now, they're waiting for the rain. The rain comes once a year or twice a year if they're lucky. They grow the crops. They all plant at the same time, all harvest at the same time. The market is flooded. The price is low. They can't sell it. They can't transport it. They don't make a lot of money. 30 40% of the food goes bad right after harvest in Africa. Right? With irrigation, hey, you can grow high-value crops. And you can have, bring them out throughout the year. And most importantly, you can bring them out in that long period where nobody else has any crops and the prices are very high. So it's actually transformational if you can irrigate. And only 4% of the farmland in Africa is actually irrigated. And that's mainly in Madagascar where they grow a lot of rice. So it's less in general. 42% of the land in Asia is irrigated. There's a huge opportunity here, obviously. And as with climate change, we're seeing less and less reliable rain. It's even more important that you can control the water on your farm and irrigate. Um, there's a huge potential, but there was no affordable technology. Um, petrol pumps, gas pumps, diesel pumps, all too expensive, hard to maintain. There's no gas in the rural areas. There's no electricity in the rural areas. Elec solar is still very expensive. There really is no alternative out there. Um, and this is why we developed our human-powered pumps. And here we have a super moneymaker pump. Little Stairmaster machine. OK, get some exercise. You, you walk back and forth on this. You have a hose pipe right here that goes down into a well. Okay, it goes down, it can go down as deep as eight meters, about 25, 30 feet. It can pull water up. Another hose pipe here that goes to your field, you can push it up another 35, 40 feet. I can push it across the road to those apartments up there, no problem, through a hose pipe, pressurized hose pipe, just like a garden hose. And you can actually irrigate two acres of land just by sitting here and doing this. Um, now, this retails at $100. This woman, Janet, here, whose picture you see, 
Um, she lived in Western Kenya. She still does live in Western Kenya. She has six children. She had a co-wife who had three children, and she had a husband. They lived on two acres of land. Now, her co-wife and her husband both died of HIV AIDS, very common in that particular area. She was left now with the nine kids. Now, typically in that area, when you get widowed, you are inherited by your husband's brother. This is one of the ways that HIV spreads. She refused. She said, I'm not going to be inherited. As a result, she was completely disowned by the family and left with absolutely nothing and these nine kids on this two-acre plot. But she was a fighter. She had to stay alive. She had a bucket, and she had a little stream that went through the plot. And she, with the kids, started irrigating with that bucket. And they irrigated an area of cabbages about the size of this room, and that kept them alive. Um, and then one day, she was in town, and uh, she saw these funny guys here selling this funny-looking pump. She talked to them. She figured, I've got to buy one of those things. She saved up. It took her almost nine months to save up the money with her cabbages in the bucket. But she did. She bought the pump. She took it home. She employed two young men. She irrigated the full two acres. And she made $3,200 profit in the first year. OK, this is a huge amount of money for someone in her situation. Today, she has become a community leader. She's told other women they don't need to be inherited. Um, and uh, she's built a house for her son. She's uh, got a place in town where she sells her produce. Um, and it's a great success story. Um, so that's nice, but this is a $100 pump. It's a little expensive for some people. So we said we need a cheaper pump. So we came up with this little thing here. It looks like a bicycle pump, right? Now, bicycle pump is actually very hard to use because of the bicycle pump. You have to do this. Your arms get very tired very, very quickly. Um, but with this pump, we call it a hip pump. And you operate like this. Turns out you can actually do this all day long. Because I'm not using my arms, I'm using my weight. As you can see, I can get into a little rowing action. With this little pump, I can have, again, a hose pipe going into a well, as deep as 25, 30 feet. Another hose pipe pushing water all the way across the road up there to the, about three stories up. Um, and uh, just like this one, a little less water. But you can irrigate one and a quarter acres with this. Um, Felix and Lucy here, very typical African family. Young couple, three young kids, no land at all. So what were they doing? They were living on her father's plot. He only had one and a half acres. What did the young man do? He went to the city to look for a job. It's a normal story. Um, he finally found a job in the slum, working in an informal restaurant. He's making about a dollar a day. He has to pay for his own rent in the slum and feed himself and send what he can home to his wife and kids. Typical story, very unsatisfactory. This particular young man saw this pump, started saving a few pennies a day, went home, got a family loan for the rest of it, um, bought the pump and rented six little plots of land that made up an acre from his neighbors. We visited him three months later. He had just sold his first harvest of uh, French beans, tomatoes, and baby corn, $1,100 profit in the first three months. Um, and he made a dollar a day by renting his pump, out, pump to the neighbor. Um, and we'll get back to him a bit later. Um, so on average, what happens when somebody goes from irrigating with a bucket to irrigating with one of these pumps? Um, $1,000 extra in net farm income is what they're making. Okay? And this really takes them from poverty into the, really into the middle class, because these are families that are living on maybe $500 a year, maybe $1,000 a year, maybe $1,500 a year. But still, you add an extra $1,000 on there. And this is transformational amount of money. Um, and how many? To date, you've heard the numbers. But we just hit uh, a few weeks ago, we just broke over. Um, about a month ago, over 100,000 profitable new businesses. This is literally half a million people out of poverty because there's five people on average per family, a business. And about 1,400 new businesses are being created every month um, with these pumps right now. And we've heard these numbers already, but the new revenues generated by these uh, pumps in Kenya alone are about 0.6% of the Kenyan GDP. And I always point out that Microsoft plus Cisco is about 0.5% of the US GDP. Um, OK, Kenya GDP is pretty small, but it's a significant number. And in Tanzania, we're already at about 0.25% of GDP. That's great, but how much money do we spend to get this kind of impact? Well, it turns out that for every dollar that we use from the donors, and I'll tell you why we need donors' money and what we do with it, these farmers make an additional $12 in new profits and wages in the first four years of their new business. Um, they go on making it for a long time, but if you count four years, that's a 12 to 1 ROI. Um, 
So how do we work? Well, we've already heard we go out and identify these business opportunities. We have a list of criteria. They have to break even in three to six months, be in farm time. They have to be affordable. They have to be environmentally sustainable. And then we have a team of designers and engineers, and we design these technologies. Um, a long list of design criteria. A poor farmer does not have a screwdriver. A poor farmer does not have a hammer. These have to be able to be taken apart just with two hands and put back together with two hands. Okay? Have to be dead easy. They have to be really ergonomically official, uh, efficient. You know, this is not easy work. You guys have been on STEM masters. We can't be wasting a lot of energy in friction. We can't be wasting a lot of energy in terms of inefficiencies here. So there's a huge amount of design that has to go into these things. There's cultural issues. We used to have treadles which are up about this height. We realized that no women were using this pump. We went and asked them, and they said, well, we can't because our hips are rotating at, at, at eye level. And uh, so you can see we've stepped down the, the design there. But thousands and thousands of hours of design go into these things, testing, retesting, um, increasing efficiency, durability, everything else. Um, and then we train large private sector factories to do high quality mass production. Right? We need to be talking about scale, not some little informal sector guy producing these things. We started this in Africa, and I did start with that little informal guy, by the way, but we very quickly learned that if we wanted to actually scale anything, we needed the biggest factories. And now we've actually moved it to China because you simply can't compete making these things in Africa. So we're actually doing mass production in China. It's the cheapest in the world, best quality. Um, and then we set up a private sector supply chain. Okay, we buy from the factories ourselves at about $68. We mark up the price. Um, we sometimes use wholesalers. We sometimes don't. Sometimes we are the wholesaler. And we then sell to local retail shops who mark up the price again. You can see everybody in the supply chain is making money. Everybody's motivated. Um, and as a result, in the long term, such a supply chain can be sustainable because it's, everybody's making money. In Kenya, Tanzania, and Mali, and a little bit of Burkina Faso where we work, we presently have 450 retail shops that sell the pumps in this supply chain. We, we sell them to them on credit, and then they on sell to the farmers. Um, and these are typical agrivet shops. We don't own these shops. They're existing private sector shops out there selling the pumps. Now, that's great, a supply chain. It turns out the supply chain and the design of the pump, actually, those two things are the easy part. Okay? The big problem is that selling a pump to a very poor person is extremely difficult. Okay? Why is this? Because we're introducing a brand new, never before seen, big ticket item to the very poorest, <laughs> very hardest to reach, and most risk-averse people in the world. And they have no savings, and they have no access to credit. Think how long it takes us to adopt to a new technology. It takes us a long time. Well, these farmers, it's even harder to convince them. And there's limited marketing information and distribution infrastructure out there. The roads don't even reach them. If they have a battery in their radio, well, if they have a radio, it only works when they have the battery, and they'd only have the battery about half the time, right? And they don't come to town. A farmer stays on his farm or her farm um, most of the time, maybe once every two weeks come to a local market, maybe once or twice a year come to a town. Um, so it's extremely hard. And on top of that, there's very limited word of mouth. Now, why is the limited word of mouth? The reason for that is if you're making money and you're very poor, you don't tell your family, let alone your neighbors. And why don't you tell them? Because if you tell them, hey, I made a whole lot of money, Everybody comes to your door begging from you and says, can we pay my school fees? Give me the money, right? So you don't, you, you don't talk about it when you make money. You talk about everything else, but not about making money. So look, word of mouth is very tough. So we have to carry out major aspirational marketing and sales campaigns. Why aspirational? Because farming in Africa generally is not aspirational. Nobody says, I'm going to be a farmer when I grow up. So we're using farmer is my business. We're not selling a pump. We're selling a better life, family life success, money maker. Um, we have good-looking farmers, you know, with big piles of produce and great-looking kids on the advertising. Um, like I say, we have to brand these retail shops so that they stand out. You can see a lot of other advertising in that retail shop. You've got to do it. We have live demonstrations. You can see here the pumps being demonstrated in front of those retail shops. Um, billboards and promotions. We have commissioned sales staff, about 160 men and women with territorial sales reps. We train them in sales skills, in farming knowledge, and every day each of them has to go out and find high, five hot prospects, people who are interested in the pump, who actually nowadays very often own a cell phone, have a farm, who are interested in maybe buying. And then we have this whole system I'll describe in a bit of how you follow up and close those sales. Fixed point demos at the retail shops on market days and the street demos. But really you have to get these pumps out to the farmers because that's where they are. 
That's where the women are. That's where the farmers are. Um, so we have lead farmers who say you can come and do a demonstration at our farm. We have women and youth groups we go demonstrate to. We go to agricultural shows where the farmers come. We go to schools. And then we have partnerships with companies, with NGOs, with outgrowers, people who are saying, OK, here's people. Let's grow some French beans for export. Why don't they all get a loan for a pump? The Ministry of Agriculture. We have to train the retailers. Many of the retail shops in Africa are not very motivated to sell. They're basically a command um, economy. People sit in the shop. You come in. You ask, do you have this? They say, no, no, I don't have it. You walk out. They don't say, oh, why don't you buy this? Why don't you buy that? They, we don't, in many places, have that real sales culture. So we have to do a lot of training, competitions, um, commissions for the retailers. We use radio, um, call-in show, cell phone hotline, send out SMS messages. We do a market storm where we line up five vehicles with music blaring and water spraying, and we drive through the rural area on the very rough dirt roads and bring people up and demonstrate the pumps into the marketplace. And then we bring them all together in a marketplace on market day, and we do pumping competitions where we've mounted two pumps on the back of a truck, and it's like a game show. And uh, you call people up randomly from the crowd, and they come and compete with each other, and everybody's screaming and yelling, and the winner end up, you know, end up getting prizes and maybe even end up winning a pump. Um, any and all kind of marketing has to be done, because we've got to get that message out there. Um, because when you're introducing a completely new product into a new market, it takes a lot of time and a lot of money. And I just want to show you graphically what I'm talking about here. Okay? I'm going to plot time along the bottom here and the cost per sale and the number of sales along the top going, going up. The red is the cost per sale. So in the beginning, when you first introduce something, the number of sales is very low. Right? And in fact, the very early adopters are not so hard to get to. They're the guys on the side of the road who are willing to try anything brand new. And you can drive up in a bus and bring out a pump and say, oh, I'll try one of those. Okay. Very easy to reach early adopters, so your costs aren't very high. But very quickly, you get past those very early adopters, and the cost goes up a lot, because you've got to get off the road. Right? You've got to, get, you've got to build an infrastructure now. And they're harder to reach and harder to convince. But the sales haven't really taken off yet. Right? Um, you need a bigger organization. Your costs are going up all the time. Your sales are still inching along down the bottom here. Right? Finally, some economies of scale start to kick in. Okay? And then all of a sudden, you get to some point where the sales where, guess what, word of mouth does start to take off. Even though people won't talk about it, all of a sudden, things take off. The sales skyrocket. The cost per sale comes down drastically. And competition then kicks in um, when it becomes uh, very low cost to sell. And you've created a whole new industry. Okay, this is true with any product anywhere in the world. I mean, it took 15 years for cell phones to get to that critical mass. Um, it took uh, 15 years for color TV to get there. Um, so, and that was selling to us. You know, it took 10 years for us to be convinced to buy a book on the internet um, instead of a book in a shop. Um, and a huge amount of money. Um, so it's even harder in Africa. There's a fundamental market failure. Private companies don't design and sell brand new big ticket products to poor farmers in Africa. And why don't they do it? Because it's only profitable at scale. It's only profitable when you're selling millions. Then it's profitable. But when you're selling a few at the beginning, it doesn't make any sense. Right? It's too expensive to build that market demand. It's just too expensive. Um, and they lose money on every sale. And this is obvious. This is the reason that farmers in Africa today are still using two tools, a handheld hoe and a machete, right, to farm with. The average farmer, that's what they still do. Why? Because nobody's figured out how to sell them a third tool. Um, and so we use donor funds to get across this market failure. Okay? We use donor funds as a smart subsidy to get to this critical mass, or we could call it a tipping point. Um, but it takes time, and it takes money. And this tipping point, people theorize, and you can see it in other markets, happens when you get to something like 15 20% of the market potential. Um, that's when word of mouth generally takes off. It might be longer here, because like I say, people don't talk about making money. So it might take longer. We don't know. Um, but eventually, you'll get to some place where it's fully sustainable and profitable supply chain. Um, but in the meantime, we're using donor funds. So if we're using donor funds, we better make sure we measure the impacts. Right? and cost effectiveness. So every pump comes with a one-year guarantee. When the farmer buys a pump, with the help of the shopkeeper, they fill out a guarantee form. We get a database of where they are, what their name is. They don't have an address, but the closest primary school or church to where they live. Um, we then randomly select people who bought the pump in the previous month or two. And we go and look for them and find them in the field. And you're wandering around in the, in the 
you know, African farmland saying, you know, I'm looking for Mary Regina Kamau, who bought a funny looking blue pump. Um, eventually you find her and you sit down and you do an interview and you find out what was her life and her family's life like the previous year. How much money did they make? What did they grow? What was their, were their kids in school? All about how they lived. And then we come back 18 months later, and then we come back 36 months later, and we can really track the change. And this is how we know that out of the pumps we've sold, we've sold more than 100,000 pumps, mind you. But out of those ones we have sold, over 100,000 have successful businesses making over $102 million a year in new profits and wages. And it costs us, with donor funds, about $350 to take one family out of poverty. And that covers all the costs, the R&D, the marketing, the sales, the impact monitoring, and everything else. You take the donor funds, divide it by the number of people who get out of poverty, and you get to that figure. So what do we mean by a family out of poverty? It means that they are no longer worried about where the next meal is coming from. They're no longer worried about having some clothes for their kids or a house to live in. They're no longer worried about sending their kids to primary school or even affording basic health care, right? This is the first step. And as a result, you know, we got 160,000 kids in school for the first time as a result of these pumps. We got 15,000 people who built new houses as a result of these pumps. We're not trying to build houses. We're not Habitat for Humanity, but this is more houses than, than they've built because people have money. Some of them build houses. People have money. They send their kids to school. This is what happens when people make a living, right? But the most important thing here is that they have some money left over after they've covered the basics, right? And with that, they can plan their futures. They can make new investments, and they do. They go buy a couple of cows, start a dairy, new businesses. They get more education, sending kids to secondary school or to college. And really, it's the first step onto a better life. And that's what we're trying to do here. It's that first step, which is why we call it Kickstart. Um, just to go to the very big picture for a second, what are we really trying to do in Africa? Maybe we say we, we're trying to create an entrepreneurial middle class. Okay? Why do we want to create an entrepreneurial middle class? Well, because frankly, one of the biggest problems in Africa right now is the governance, right? And why is governance a big problem? It's a big problem because we have, quote, democracy in place, but the cost of a vote in the rural area in particular is about one or two dollars, right? When it comes down to it, you can go out and buy a vote. Um, and that's what people do. It's more expensive in the urban areas. It's cheaper in the rural areas. As long as the cost of the vote is one or two dollars, democracy doesn't work very well, right? So, we need to increase the cost of the vote. I always say, let's increase the cost of the vote. Make it $10 or $15 or $20, $30. We'll get better democracy. We get better governance. We get more investment. We get a growing economy. We get more jobs, um, better government services, more successful states. And we really are trying to reverse that downward spiral. But the first step is to create people who have enough money to look after themselves and invest in their future. So what's the global potential for these pumps? Something like 35 to 40 million, you can see, we're obviously guessing here, but you know, something eight, somewhere about uh, 15 to 20 million in Africa, another 20 million of these pumps in, in Asia, and four or five million in, in Central America. Maybe it's much more, it's, it's hard to, to really know, but it's, it's big. What have we got out there? We've got 100,000 pump users, we're just scratching the surface. So that's great, but then you have to say, okay, well, is it time to scale this up? Is this something worth scaling up, actually? Because scaling up is going to cost a lot of money, right? So how do you decide what to scale up? That's a very important question in this whole field, right? Um, so I've been doing a lot of thinking about this. I have a website called Real Good Not Feel Good that you can take a look at, .org. Um, but some of these lessons are to have a high-impact social enterprise that can really get to large scale and lasting solutions to the world's biggest problems, um, you really have to ask four questions of any particular social enterprise, OK? There's four very simple questions. Do you have measurable and proven impacts? And I'm not going to go into this in detail now. If you want to, I can talk more about it in the questions and answers, but I'm going to go through this very quickly. That's the first question. Second one is, are your impact cost effective? Is it cheap or expensive to get an impact? Is it a good deal or a bad deal? Are they sustainable? Now, I'm talking about sustainable impacts, not sustainable enterprises. Big difference. I'm talking about the impacts being sustainable, which means that the present beneficiaries can go on benefiting, and future beneficiaries in that same area can also start to benefit when there's no more donor funding. That's what we mean by sustainable impacts. And is your model scalable and replicable? If it is, if you can say yes to all of these, then you have a chance that what you're doing makes sense. In Kickstart's case, we put it through the same filter. Yes, we can prove we can get people out of poverty. Um, yes, it's pretty cost effective at $350. Um, sustainable impacts, we're going to leave in place ultimately a profitable business and supply chain. 
Um, and replicable and scalable model, yes, we scaled up in one country, we've proven we can do it in even poorer countries. So, in my mind, yes, it's worth now investing in really scaling what we do. But a good model and a good product is simply not enough. Remember, we really have the most challenging marketing and sales job in the whole world. Okay? We're selling a brand new, never before seen thing to the very poorest people in the world, in Africa, in the rural area. Right? This is very difficult. That means we have to be really good at it. In fact, we have to be better than Coca-Cola at it. They're selling an addictive sticky drink to poor people, and they're pretty good. But our challenge is much, much bigger. Right? So we have to be better at marketing and sales than they are. That's not easy. But we need to build a high-performing company to make that happen. Right? It's, it's not something you're going to do on a shoestring. Um, we need to raise money, first of all. And so in the last few years, we've sort of doubled our, our income in terms of fundraising. We need the right people. We need a management team from the private sector, people who really know how to do this. Um, we've got about 250 staff right now. We do a lot of training and make a lot of investment in people. Um, we need the right systems. We need an ERP, MIS system, so we know what the numbers are, have them on our fingertips, so we can manage the whole um, process. It's a complicated supply chain. We're bringing things in from China, distributing to actually about 20 countries in Africa right now. Um, and we need performance management systems. We have to have fantastic branding, marketing, and sales, right? And we need great products. Um, so you have to build those things. So we're planning to expand. What are we going to do? We're going to scale up our impacts, get beyond this islands of success. I talked in the very beginning about the fact that nothing goes to scale. We get these little islands of things that are really nice little projects that work, but it hasn't gone to scale. We've got to get beyond that. Um, we're going to concentrate on irrigation pumps and technologies. We're not going to go and divert ourselves with a lot of other things for now. Um, expand our retail sales in the countries where we are, um, in Kenya, Tanzania, and Mali. Push towards that tipping point. We're going to establish the moneymaker brand, and we're already doing all this stuff, as a global brand. Um, and that means selling to NGOs around the world. Um, already we have pumps all across Africa. We sell to all the big nonprofits and um, everyone from WFP to Save the Children to World Vision to Mercy Call, they're all buy our pumps and use them in their programs. Um, we have wholesale shops already in Ethiopia, Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, Malawi, and Zambia, as well as our retail shops where I said in Kenya, Tanzania, Mali, and Burkina. Um, and we have to think about making these pumps more affordable. We can make the pumps cheaper, and we're going to talk about that. We already have made this one cheaper. We're going to make this one cheaper soon. Um, but we have to eventually think about credit if we really want this thing to take off. Now, rural credit is really difficult. Nobody has really cracked how to do rural credit in Africa. Why? Because people live on their farms and work on their farms. They're very dispersed. It's very expensive to set up a rural microfinance program in Africa. The cost of customer acquisition is about $250 per person. You can't have a sustainable credit system with that expensive cost of customer acquisition. So it's just not there. A few people are experimenting with a lot of money from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and other places. We're hooking up with them. Anyone who can do it, we're there ready and waiting to work with them. Meanwhile, we have another idea that we're putting in place, which is micro savings. Layaway was very, very big in the 50s and the 60s here in America. And then it disappeared when credit cards came in. Layaway means that you pay a little bit of the time until you've paid fully, and then you get to keep the product. Right? It's actually come back in the last couple of years with the credit crisis. Um, if you go to Kmart and other places, they have layaway now. So we want to do layaway in Africa using cell phones to transfer the money. So a farmer, because cell phones are out there, can now make a money transfer on cell phones. This is a system which is there in Kenya and is increasingly going to be across the rest of Africa very quickly. Um, and they can make a little deposit. They get a bit more money. They can deposit more. When they're finally paid for the pump, they can go down to the local shop. We transfer the money. They get their pump. Um, so we've just started this on a pilot basis. We have our first 25 layaway customers signed up in the last few weeks. Um, again, you have to build a lot of trust. People are taking, you're taking people's money. Um, you have to do a lot of marketing and sales to make this happen. But I really think this is the ultimate solution for poor people in Africa to buy things. Um, we have to use new technologies. I talked about our hot prospecting, where we go out and the salespeople have to identify five hot prospects every day. Well, we collect those. We have an automated server-based system where every Friday they go and they go to a cyber cafe and they enter onto our server. And what they get back is a work plan for the next week of exactly how they're going to close all those sales. Right? Who are they going to visit? Who are they going to phone? Who are they going to SMS? What are the, what's the sales pitch going to be? Um, how are they going to actually close that sale? 
Um, and now we have the biggest list of high potential farmers in East Africa because we're collecting 150 people, collecting five a day. We've got a lot of very high potential farmers. Can we monetize those lists? And now we can start to sell seeds and fertilizer and other inputs down through those lists as well and work with private companies to do that. We're working now to form moneymaker farmers clubs so that these farmers who buy a pump can now start networking with each other on their cell phones. They can find out, let's get together and get that order for tomatoes. The guy wanted a whole truck of tomatoes. Well, if we grow them together, we can fill it. Um, they can share information about, oh my god, this, this, we've got some blight on our cabbages. How do we fix that? Um, we actually want to do sort of the Facebook social networking for farmers. Um, that's a new project which we're just starting to explore now. Um, and meanwhile, we have to think about this tipping point. The tipping point's a long way in the future, right? That's why we have to be cost effective. That's why we have to be very careful we get real impacts with our donor funds. But we don't want to forget about the tipping point. So we're doing an experiment in Western Kenya where we've picked a little area, 30 by 70 kilometers, and we're pouring extra marketing money into that area, right? About 1.1 million people live there, and we're doing new promotions, and we're measuring awareness and measuring understanding of value. Because if you think about the process for someone to be converted into a buyer, first of all, you have to be aware of the new technology. You know, oh, I, yeah, I know what a moneymaker pump is, sure. And then you have to understand what's the value of that pump to me as a farmer. Will I actually be able to use it on my farm and make money? And that's quite a leap. And we remember, maybe you guys are too young, but I remember with uh, personal computers. Yeah, I knew about personal computers for many, many years. But before I bought one, I really had to be convinced that this was going to be useful for me. And that took a long time. Um, and it does. Um, anyway, and then we want to see, can we accelerate that by pouring more money into it, more marketing, more innovative methods, more networking, um, and then apply those lessons to where else we are. Meanwhile, we want to improve the way we measure our impacts. It's very important. We're using donor funds. We have to be sure we have impacts. We need an independent outside impact study to be done. We've been doing it internally so far, and that's great, and you always have to monitor your impacts internally. For one thing, it means you're talking to your customers and getting marketing information from your customers. If you don't talk to your customers, you don't know how to serve them. At the same time, you're measuring the impacts. But it's good also to get an outside impact study done. We're using IFPRI, one of the top uh, research institutions in the country, International Food Policy Research Institute. We're doing a three-year longitudinal randomized study with 1,300 farmers tracking these farmers over three years, looking at changes in income, changes in child health, um, measuring height, measuring weight of these farmers, changes in the way they use their water and sanitation. Now they've got more water. Do they actually have better hygiene as well? Do they have better health as well? Because more water means you can wash your hands more often because you've got a pump now and you've got a well. Um, education, women's empowerment, environment. We're looking at all those things. Meanwhile, we need to redesign the pumps for China manufacture to reduce the costs and increase the margins. We just went through a detailed exercise with this pump. Um, we did completely reconsidered the design and manufacturing. A whole lot of innovations went into the new design. We did a whole bunch of uh, testing using computer-aided design and fatigue testing on these pumps. We had some packing innovations because you're shipping from China. You want to be able to fit two pumps into the space of one pump. Um, if you want to reduce the cost. All this is standard practice in industry, but we're doing it now at Kickstart. Um, and as a result of that, we have our new Moneymaker Max, which is uh, not here, but it's the new one we just came out with. Um, $17 cheaper landed cost than this one. Five kilos lighter. You can feel this is pretty heavy. Actually, as durable, even more durable, because we got some stainless steel in it, which this one doesn't. Um, and 5% more efficient to use, easier to use. Um, we're now going to do that on a hip pump to reduce this cost also, try to get $7 off that. Um, and then we need new pumps. Some farmers have water which is deeper than 7 or 8 meters. You need a completely different pumping technology for that. Um, these won't be able to pull water beyond 8 meters. It's actually part of the laws of physics. It's air pressure which forces the water up. Um, so for that, we need a different kind of pump. And we're trying to get a pump that will go at 45 feet deep, but also pressurize the water 40 feet high. We've got a couple of patented technologies, um, which we're now turning into a product. It's not there yet. It's a very difficult design challenge, it turns out, to design a pump which is portable, self-installed, um, that can do that. Hand auger, how do people dig wells? Generally, people dig their wells by hand. They just dig a hole in the ground. Um, the farmer digs it if it's 10 to 12 feet deep. 
Deeper than that, they generally have a well digger who will go down even 100 feet, two guys, one guy with a bucket and a rope, and the other guy down the bottom with a chisel and a hammer going through even solid rock and pulling, the, pulling it up. Um, but if we could have a hand auger, all the better. This one we've developed goes through soft soils, doesn't go through hard rock. Um, but already we have 300 wells, and actually many people are using it with this little hip pump and selling water, clean water from it. Um, we need better manual well drilling, water harvesting and storage for those people who don't have wells, um, and other technologies, drip irrigation. Our five-year plan, build capacity and new innovations, moving to new countries. You can see some of the short-listed countries there. We want to get to the point where we're selling 100,000 pumps per year, um, where we're creating 80,000 businesses per year. 400,000 people out of poverty per year, and do that all at a lower cost than we are now, down to a total cost of $50 per person out of poverty. Um, but just to get back to our farmers, um, this couple here, an elderly couple in western Kenya, you might remember the violence we had in Kenya a couple of years ago. Um, they were burning down houses. They literally got to 50 meters from, from these people's farm. Um, and uh, these guys bought this pump, an elderly couple, and I visited them, the guy told me, look, there's a high price, there's an unlimited de demand for these vegetables. Um, he is uh, richer than he's ever been in his life. He did this, doing this in his retirement, um, and uh, absolutely ecstatic. Um, this particular family here, um, very sad story. Um, they had nine, a family of nine, so seven kids, um, and his father they were living on his father's plot. His father died, but he'd put up the land as collateral for a loan that he hadn't repaid. They took all the land. They ended up with absolutely nothing. They moved to this other area as squatters in a swampy area, um, and they started irrigating with a bucket, built a little mud shack um, with all the family there. And then he saw one of these pumps. They saved up the money. They bought this pump. They're irrigating about three or four acres. Actually, he's gone to a petrol pump now. He's lent this pump now to his brother, who's starting a tree nursery. Um, he's built a big house, his wife has bought a maize mill, a motorized maize mill, um, and they've got uh, totally changed their lives. Um, this particular guy here, he was a school teacher, and he retired. And he showed me two things he bought with his retirement money, which wasn't a whole lot of money. He bought an eighth acre of land, plot of land, one eighth of an acre, and he bought this little pump. And those are his two proudest possessions. He's got 13 people living on that little plot of land, extended family. And this little pump is keeping them alive um, and actually thriving. Um, this family here, in that violence, a lot of people were displaced. People went to the camps, uh, IDP, internally displaced people's camps. And people were very afraid to move back to their homes. Um, this couple was the first couple back to their homes. They bought one of these pumps. They built that little shack, which was the first house. And this was an area where, as far as you could see, every house had been burnt to the ground during the violence. They were the first people back. They're now feeding people in the camps. And they're actually selling vegetables to the people who actually burnt down their house. Um, and very proud that even, even their enemies are buying from them. And just one final story to get back to our friends Felix and Lucy I told you about before. We went to visit them the other day. The other day, we went there and we looked at their tomato plants. They had 2,000 tomato plants in the field and a whole bunch of other crops. <laughs> they had 80,000 tomatoes on those plants. It was worth $6,500 of tomatoes just on that day that we visited them um, in their field. And they employ three people full time and 10 people when they harvest. Um, they've bought land, they're building a house. Um, and like I say, I can tell thousands more stories. So thanks. Maybe I talked so fast that nobody understood a word I said or that I answered all the questions already. <laughs> sure, I'll ask a question then. Hi. Um, so first of all, really excited about hearing your presentation. I've seen a lot of um, irrigation technology in Africa where the business innovations have not been coupled with the technological innovations. It's really exciting to see. I was also really inter interested to see that you had experience in water previously. 
And I'm sure that you learned through your water work that there's huge problems with making a profitable business model, getting a supply chain up and running. Nobody's really been able to crack the nut of getting our private sector working in water in Africa. So I'm curious if you have any ideas based on your work in agriculture that would cross apply into the water sector. In terms of selling clean water? Yeah, and getting it so yeah. that it's actually a sustainable model where yeah. water pumps aren't breaking yeah. down. Well, so I mean, there's, there's the normal community model, right? And we were doing sort of state-of-the-art community model, which is you train the community, you get their involvement. Um, they're supposed to even sort of raise money for maintenance. But by the time, break, by the, time the pump breaks down three or four years later, the, com the committee that you put together has dissolved. They don't have any money anymore, and the thing fails. So you're right. Though those things generally fail. Now, people are now looking into completely private sector solutions. Uh, the best group to talk to there is a group called Acquire. Um, and they're working in Kenya. And they're really, what they've got here now is six or seven different business models that they're testing to see which one can work. And it's really selling bottled water, but it's selling bottled water in those big uh, spring bottles. Um, and with those bottles, of course, you don't own the bottle. You, you rent the bottle and you just come in for refills. Um, and um, they have actually got six businesses up and running now with different business models trying to figure out which one is really going to work the best. And that's everything actually from uh, using pure, uh, pulling water out of a muddy stream and using pure, using one of our pumps from a tube well, um, to uh, more sophisticated uh, um, processes where they're actually doing a whole bunch of cleansing in the water as well. Um, um, this is rural. They're trying to solve it in rural. But, but it's in, in the urban, it, it happens. Um, if you look at what's happened in the Philippines, what's happened in Indonesia, in those countries, something like 70% of poor people already buy water. There's tens of thousands of small commercial um, water, clean water businesses. And basically building on that experience is what we have to do and see if we can bring that to Africa um, in terms of the commercial. Yeah. Thank you for your really inspiring presentation. Um, I'm wondering, especially about this question of credit for um, the poorest in Africa, how do you conceive of that? And also, could you talk a little bit more about how the poorest of the poor are able to save up money? Because I know there's an organization similar to yours in Thailand that has had two major challenges with, with both of those things. Thanks. Yeah, so credit for the very poorest is a mixed story. If we look at the, the real facts behind microfinance, I mean, some great facts there. You know, 100 million people have access to microfinance, which is fantastic. Uh, but if you look at the randomized trials they've done on microfinance, what you discover is that 25% of the people who get a loan actually, and this is compared to control groups, 25% of the people who get the loan actually have an improved life compared to the control. For 50%, it makes no difference at all. And for 25%, they're actually worse off than if they, had got the, if they hadn't got the loan. Um, and so overall, you know, 25, 50, 25, it's not a huge... Uh, real impact in terms of microfinance. And, and the reason for this is you know, putting people in debt is always a bit of a, a risk, right? Because now they'll make major sacrifices in order to pay those debts. They'll take other loans. They'll go to money lenders in order to pay off the microfinance organization. Um, and there's challenges there. Um, so while microfinance in general, I would say, has been you know, a huge success, it's gone to scale, um, one has to be a bit cautious about claiming the real social impacts on, on a large scale. Um, in terms of the rural areas, it's like I said, it's a very big challenge to get finance to people because organizing a group in the rural area when people live in a dispersed area is very difficult. It's much easier in Asia, especially in India and Bangladesh, where people tend to live in a village and farm on a farm. So they walk out to their farm every day. Because then you can literally go into the village and go door to door and put together your credit group. And so people like Brack have, have done that very, very effectively in Grameen, of course. Um, and this is why we're now talking about... Um, micro savings instead of micro finance and micro loans. Um, because people have income throughout the year. Usually they're, if a very poor person, their income and their cash flow is very, very lumpy. Okay, so they, they sell a harvest, they make some money. They sell a goat, they make some money. They have to pay school fees, they, you know, they go to a hospital, it goes like this. So their cash flow is very, very lumpy. So people do at some time in the year, they'll have a bit of money. And if they can put it away into a savings account, um, then they actually, it's the lowest risk thing to do. They save, and then it's the lowest risk way for us also um, to sell somebody something is layaway. Um, so we really, I really believe that that's layaway and micro savings is the solution here, um, as opposed to credit. But how do our fa farmers get the money to buy the pumps? Um, these are generally cash from family loans, 
and savings. Because again, because you have this uh, lumpy cash flow, you know, family sells its maize. Okay, they have $100. They have to decide, do we spend the $100 on this or do we spend it on school fees? Well, if they spend it on the pump, they're gonna pay school fees the rest of their life. If they spend it on school fees and, you know, and some other immediate needs, it's gonna be a one-off thing. Um, and so it's hard for people to save, but the more they value something, the more they are. And if you look at bicycles, which have obviously reached a tipping point many, many, many years ago in Africa, and everybody knows what a bicycle is, and they understand it from when they're a young kid. Um, in Tanzania, something like 30% of households in the rural area actually own a bicycle. A bicycle's about the same price as one of our pumps. Um, so if they understand the value, they can come up with the money. If you look at weddings and funerals, people spend a huge amount of money on weddings and funerals. Again, they can come up with it. Yeah. When I was hearing about this, I, two thoughts came to when I was hearing about this, two thoughts came to mind. One was, um, you know, what would happen if you mashed what you're doing with Kiva.org, um, and you know Kiva, of course. And mm -hmm. then the other is the Heifer Project. Yep. So uh, can you talk? You, you must have thought about taking the best of those and sort of combining it with. Because yeah, I, I hate absolutely. to hear how long it takes them to save up this money. Absolutely. So uh, I think with Kiva, one has to be very careful that we un really understand Kiva's business model. Kiva is really, a, <laughs> it's really an internet model. It's really just a front-end internet model, right? What happens when you give your $25 to Kiva is they go out and they identify a microfinance organization in Africa, right, who are actually usually using donor funds to do all that it takes to do microfinance, which is go out there and recruit the groups and give them a loan and collect from them, and all the dirty mechanics happens down on the ground. And Kiva works with dozens and dozens of microfinance organizations, but they simply pass through their money to the MFI, who then give out the loan, collect the, debt, collect the money, give it back to uh, Kiva, and Kiva gives it back to you. Okay? Kiva doesn't actually do any of that work themselves. Right? So that Kiva is not giving loans to poor people. And there's a little bit of a misunderstanding there. Many people look at Kiva and think that Kiva is actually doing it. They're not. They give loans to MFIs that give loans to poor people. And those MFIs, the majority of them, are actually not for-profit MFIs. The big for-profit MFIs are not that interested in Kiva. Why? Because Kiva insists that you have a story of your farmer and the story of your entrepreneur. Well, it's expensive to go get that story, right? And so why should a big MFI, which can go get commercial money, go to Kiva and have to write a story when they can get commercial money? instead. Um, and so Kiva's getting around this a little bit with some of the big MFIs by making agreements that, okay, they don't have to write about an individual entrepreneur, they can write about a group. So BRAC is now taking some Kiva money. Um, but it's a group, it's not, if, if you look at Kiva's site, you'll see it's not an individual anymore. Um, anyway, so we're looking at those MFIs to partner with, not, not Kiva, because the problem is in the field, it's the MFIs, the microfinance institutions, um, which actually have to give the loans and collect the loans. Um, so that's, that's the story with Kiva. Um, in terms of Heffa, Heffa believes in giving things away. Um, very successful. Um, they give away a cow with the idea that when the cow has its first calf, you're supposed to give that calf um, to your next family. And then that family, when they have its first calf, is supposed to give it to another family. So it's sort of a one-off gift that goes on giving. Um, my personal feeling about it is, is, again, it's not very sustainable in that initially, Heifer still has to come in, identify who to give to, right? How do they figure out who to give to? It's, it's not easy to figure out who to give something to, who's deserving. When I was at Action Aid, we used to give a lot of things away. We used to give to poor kids. I remember one time going into a classroom, and these were supposed to be the very poorest kids in the community. We had all the kids stand on one side of the room. We had all the parents stand on the other side of the room. We asked those young kids, you know, six, five, eight-year-olds, to go to their parents, walk across the room to their parents. That's when we discovered that it wasn't the poor families at all. It was the wealthy families who had those kids who were sponsored by us. Um, we didn't know that. Um, so anyway, so it's, it's not easy to pick the poor families. And it's not really fair in my mind to pick the poor families to give, to give the cow to. Um, but but uh, in fact, uh, Heifer has given away some of our pumps. Um, we, we have collaborated with them. They have bought pumps in places. Um, but that's, that's my thoughts there. Hi. <clears throat> Hi there. Um, thank you for your presentation. My name is Nathaniel. Uh, my question is, as you approach that uh, tipping point that you were talking about, um, have you done any kind of research on what the possible effects might be on the water table in those areas? Um, I see that being kind of a 
one of the limiting factors to the kind of 30 million, 40 million numbers that you were uh, projecting earlier. Thank Absolutely. You. This gives, gives me an opportunity to talk about my next slide, which is uh, <laughs> the environmental impacts. Um, because it's a, it's a good question. What happens to the, what, what are the environmental impacts of what we're doing or of any of these things? And of course, you, you want to design something that has minimum environmental impact. So one of the first things to understand, of course, is unless people can look after themselves, they're not going to look after the environment. If you can't feed your kids, you don't care whether you cut down the forest <laughs> to try to feed them, right? Only when you can look after yourself are you going to look after the environment. Um, so when you design the technology, you have to think about the environmental impacts and, and try to minimize it, right? So if we think about these pumps, um, well, it's renewable energy. Um, we're not using petrol or diesel or anything like that. Um, and because it's human powered, and this is the key thing, you're not going to over irrigate. It's simply too much work to go out there and pump extra if you don't need it. And because it's hose pipe irrigation, you put the water directly to the roots of the plant or you spray it. So again, you're not going to over irrigate. So as opposed to flood irrigation or channel irrigation where you use a huge amount of water um, and you get salination of uh, the soil um, as a result of those things. With hose pipe irrigation, you, you don't get those things. And so you're not going to suck down the water table too much because it's simply too much work. But on top of that, these are shallow rain-fed aquifers that fill up with the rains. Right? We're not talking about those deep aquifers um, where you know, that water takes 10,000 years to, to build up down there. We're talking about aquifers that get refilled. Um, and uh, so, you know, yes, eventually, if everybody's sucking at the same time, the aqua does go down. It always goes down in the dry season anyway. And you need deeper pumps, but it fills back up when the rains come. Um, we also, of course, encourage this crop rotation and adding soil nutrients because people have more money. They're going to use compost. They're going to use fertilizer. So it's actually much better for the soil. Um, we're actually sequestering carbon year round because we have greenery all year round instead of not having greenery half the year round. Um, we got microclimates. We're preventing soil erosion. And a lot of people are planting tree nurseries uh, with these pumps and planting trees. Um, so thanks. Yeah. Um, as, uh, as people try and understand what social entrepreneurship could be, um, I see a lot of competing philosophies with regards to how you should adapt you know, business tools to social problems. So like, should it be for profit or non-profit? So for example, so my question is if a competitor came along Right? maybe even a local competitor, and, and their idea was very similar to yours, maybe different, maybe even they just copied it. Would you see that as a victory or as a threat? So ultimately, we want all the competitors in the world to come along and make human-powered pumps. What we're trying to do at Kickstart is create a situation where there's an industry manufacturing human-powered pumps for very poor people. Um, that's our ultimate goal. right? Now, the reality is no competitor is going to come along right now. Why? Because we're losing money on every sale. We're spending, in marketing alone, we're spending $180 to convince someone to buy a pump that we've got a $15 margin on. No competitor in their right mind is going to do that unless they identically photocopy our pump and pretend that it is our pump, right? And ride on the back of our marketing. And, and that would be OK if they could really do the quality. The trouble is they won't. And when you're introducing a brand new technology, quality is absolutely critical. Because news about making money doesn't travel. News about things not working travels like lightning. right? And so you can absolutely kill a technology by putting out something which doesn't work. And we've seen this. The one place where we have competitors is in what I call our B2B sales. This is selling to NGOs. This is selling to governments. Okay, because there you only have to convince one guy and you can often give him a bribe and, and you get your order. You know, let me buy a container load of pumps for Save the Children or for um, the government of uh, whatever. Um, I used to work at ActionAid. This is, I, got, I got offered bribes many times when I was in purchasing officer at ActionAid um, to, to buy. Um, and um, so, you know, that can easily, on that side, someone can compete with us and people are competing with us, right? And so, for example, we have the case in um, Malawi, where the government wanted to get 40,000 pumps so they could give them away. And they ordered 40,000 pumps, cheap knockoffs of our pumps from India. Now, the problem is the pumps didn't work. And uh, the farmers, as a result, decided this whole technology was useless. And it's only through the work of one particular NGO in Malawi, who have bought 20,000 of our pumps and really worked with the farmers, 
that the whole technology has made a recovery in Malawi. The exact same thing happened in Ethiopia. We went to visit a farmer in Ethiopia. He told us, what do you think we are, donkeys? We can't, we can't use a human-powered pump. It doesn't pump any water. You know, it's too hard work. And we asked the guy, look, if we had a pump your grandmother could use, we'd, you know, and he said, I get out of here. There's no pump my grandmother could use. We brought out this pump. We put him on the pump. He started pumping. He paid us cash on the spot. <laughs> and so, yes, we want to encourage competitors. And this is why we want to get to that tipping point, because then the private sector will take off. This is not about Kickstart being sustainable. It's about Kickstart being really good at getting through this market failure and getting to that tipping point. But private companies won't do it. This is, this is the market failure there, right? So private companies won't do this. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Dan. I'm here at um, NYU Wagner. I had a question regarding uh, the adoption of technology for farmers who are traditionally dependent on rainfall uh, for, for irrigation and bringing pumps into those communities. Uh, so what type of challenges does your organization face when, when looking at the transfer of technology? Um, I didn't hear you talk much about any sort of farmer field school or anything along, along I'm working with the farmers in the field to, to deploy irrigated technology for crops. And also what um, steps have been taken uh, in Kenya in particular uh, or throughout the areas where, you're, where, you're highly, um, where, where your technology has been highly deployed to look at soil quality as well as types of techniques for improving or excuse me the use of improved uh, varieties of seeds and fertilizers as a combination to reach the kind of numbers your, your presentation. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, like I said, we have to, to get to these farmers, to convince these farmers, we have to take the pumps out to the farm. So we have a huge amount of energy and effort on farming demonstrations. So we do. We go out there um, and we demonstrate. We have lead farmers who bring their neighbors together. We demonstrate what irrigation is all about. We teach them about irrigation because we have to convince them what the value of our pump is in order to convince them to buy. So we, we do a lot of that. Um, in terms of the other inputs, like seeds and fertilizer, um, absolutely it's not just irrigation which is going to convert Africa into an agricultural powerhouse. Um, they need seeds and fertilizer, they need infrastructure, they need storage, they need all sorts of other things. Um, irrigation is a great first step because it allows you to get off season. Um, while if you simply give seeds and fertilizer, you plant a lot more with the rains, you flood the market further, more food goes to waste, you don't actually solve the problem. So if you're only going to do one thing, irrigation is a great first step. Um, but what we're actually doing now is we're partnering with the seed companies and the fertilizer companies to get out there on our farmer demos and also talk about seeds and fertilizer. We're doing bundling where we'll actually sell a pump bundled now with seeds and fertilizer. Um, and so there's that kind of training. When we're talking about this Facebook uh, for cell phone Facebook for farmers, um, that's the kind of information that's going to be going through there. We're talking about a cell phone number where farmers can now call and get information about uh, farming if there's a problem. There's already a service like that being set up in Kenya already. Um, we're talking about manuals. Um, right now we have very simple manuals that come with the pump, tell you how to maintain the pump. We're talking about farming manuals which are actually sponsored by the private sector um, who now want to sell seeds and fertilizer so we can have a manual which actually goes into a lot more detail about how to, how to actually farm. And we're also looking at, um, you know, and, and this is not directly at Kickstart, although one day it may be, is the idea of um, for-profit farm extension. Um, farm extension in Africa has, has really failed. Um, the reason for this is the government uh, employees um, have not been highly motivated, have not been paid enough, have not had transport. And so we've wasted literally billions of dollars over the years in farm extension ac across Africa. It's been one of the big failures. Um, but Privately, it makes sense it could work, right? Because farmers want to increase their yields. So what if as an extension worker, you go into a valley and you know, you've got 30 farmers there and you say, look, I'm going to come and live with you for a year. I'm going to triple your um, yields and your income. And at the end of it, all I want is 10% of your increased income. And I'm going to teach you how to farm. I'm going to tie you up to markets. I'm going to help you get credit, um, help you get seeds and fertilizer. Um, Anyway, so, and there's a couple of very nice social enterprises that are starting to do that. The best one is probably One Acre Fund. I don't know if you're aware of them, but they're doing fantastic work uh, on tripling the um, incomes of very, very poor farmers with a basically commercial farm extension model. Um, so, and also we tie in with people like that. 
Hi, uh, Lori from uh, NYU Sackler, and I wanted to know if you could uh, talk a little bit more about the technology development process, how you put a good team together, and when something is five to ten years out, when do you start thinking about building the supply chain and building capital, and, and what are the first steps? Yeah, so it's a good, good question. I mean, and it really gets into, into product management and product pipelines. And how do, you, how do you think about, you know, what products you want to have five years out? Um, and to be honest, we're not very good at it yet. It's something we're learning about. We've just hired our first product managers. Um, we're just doing our first sort of product pipeline. Um, until now, it's pretty much been um, really a little bit random, but sort of thinking, okay, what, what do we think is a good thing? And not really putting enough uh, research and numbers behind that. Um, and so... There's two, two aspects, of course. One is, you know, you take a product like this and you say, okay, we want to reduce the cost and we want to, uh, you know, turn this into a, into a better product at a lower cost, which is continuous improvement. And that we've just done this uh, sort of one and a half year exercise where we did, we took the $17 out of this. And now we've got a new pump and so then we're doing a market test of that new pump. We've got 160 pumps out there and find out, you know, does it actually work in the field? Do farmers prefer it? Do they not like it? What's wrong with it? What's good with it? Um, so you got that whole bit of it there, and then from there, planning the whole product launch because you know are we getting rid of this pump um, and replacing it with the other pump while we having the two pumps side by side when you introduce a new product. Um, in terms of sort of the teams for product design, um, you want some pretty hardcore engineering because you really it takes some pretty hardcore engineering, and then you need some product design type people who are more into the softer side of uh, you know what is it going to take to actually understand a farmer's needs what in the design, you know, like things like I said, you know, you step down this because, you know, you discover that women won't use the pump. Um, you know, what are the social economic issues that go along with it? Um, we have a very small team. Um, we literally, I used to do a lot of the design myself. We now have a small team. We have one English uh, um, engineer, two Kenyan engineers, and uh, one Kenyan designer, and then a team of about 10 technicians. Um, and it takes us a long time to get a new product out. Our deep lift pump, for example, we've been working on on and off literally for about eight years now, and it's not there yet. It's a very difficult challenge, but it takes time. Um, yeah. Hi, I'm Jessica. Um, I was just wondering, you mentioned how Heifer gives things away instead of selling. And I was just wondering, in the case of humanitarian aid, why you think maybe the market-based approach isn't isn't used more often if it's working better because those selling are seeking out what their consumers actually want and what they actually need versus just giving things that aren't necessarily useful. Yeah. And why, why not? So it's a good question. I think in historically, aid was all about feeling good because people are starving, people need help, they just have to be given things. Okay, and, and certainly when Nick and I first started talking about selling stuff, it was almost, uh, you know, almost heretics at the time. I'm um, saying that you know, we should sell things to poor people because this was way back in you know, the early 90s. It was really before social enterprise really got anywhere. Um, today, of course, with social enterprise, you know, there has been a switch in the thinking. Um, and even, you know, even the big organizations are starting to switch. And so, for example, you know, people like Save the Children, like World Food Program, like World Vision, even they are starting to sell things in, instead of just give. Um, and there is that distinction between relief and development. And in the case of relief, yes, when people are actually starving, you go to Ethiopia and people are dying, you know, you're not going to sell them things. You have to give them you know, something to keep them alive. In terms of development, of course, I, I do think that selling is certainly more sustainable. And we are, we are starting to see, certainly in the time that I've been working on it, we've seen the needle literally go from here to here. Um, and you know, I think we're continuing to push it. Um, and uh, there's one thing that the social enterprise field is really doing, and you know, that's why it's great to have the what you guys are doing here um, is really opening up uh, that communication and discussing the real difference. Um, one of the things that we're looking at with our, with our um, randomized trial that we're doing is that if you sell something to someone, you have a very different customer than if you give it to them. And so what's the control group going to look like? Right? Because usually when you do a randomized trial, you take a room of people like this and you randomly appoint your numbers and you know, half of you get given something and the other half don't and we follow you. Um, now, if I'm selling you things, well, half of you are going to buy the thing, but you're going to be very different than the people who didn't buy it. So where's my control group gone? And so now we have to develop a whole new methodology of, of control groups. 
for um, when you're selling things. It's much harder to measure the impacts. Um, because maybe if someone is not entrepreneurial enough to buy it, they would have done well anyway, even without the pump. Maybe they were just entrepreneurs and they were going to get ahead anyway, right? Um, so we're taking as our control group the people who buy the pump a little bit later and the people who buy the pump a little bit later. So now we can actually use difference of differences and look at the starting position of the people who buy the pump, you know, six months later, a year later, 18 months later, because they're identical type people. They're entrepreneurs also. Um, and, you know, they're making that purchase. And we look at their starting position compared to the position of the people who've now bought it in the beginning. Um, we have time for one more question. Hi, my name is Daria. Um, so now you've had a lot of experience marketing and selling these products across countries in Africa where cultures are absolutely you know, different from one another. Are there some learnings that you'll be able to take with you as eventually you uh, will hopefully expand to Asia and to Latin America uh, where, you know, again, the cultures will be quite diverse, uh, different approaches you've, uh, that you're considering with, with the sales and marketing end? Yeah, I think... You know, one of the criteria that I always look at is, is your model needs to be replicable. And what that means is with minor modifications, you should be able to take it to a place which is pretty different. Now, you do have to do some minor modifications, but, but the trick to making something replicable, in my mind, is really the sort of keep it simple, right? Um, which is the fundamentals of the model have to be really simple, and that's what is translatable. The details um, are different. You know, for example, we're selling in Mali compared to Kenya. Well, Mali is Muslim. In Mali, people live in villages. They don't live on the farm. In Kenya, they live on the farm. In Kenya, it's Christian. Um, you know, very, very different culture. Mali has had a history of kingdoms, you know, with Timbuktu and, and places in Mali. Kenya <laughs> hasn't, you know. Um, so completely different cultures. Um, and, but a lot of the fundamentals are the same. Um, people are still trying to get ahead. Um, people are still convinced that... If they can make more money, it's worth investing. Um, we've actually had to change the name of the pump in Mali because uh, the local language there, we call it the Nafarozo pump, um, which means a similar thing to moneymaker, but uh, you know, they don't understand moneymaker. They can't say moneymaker in, in, in French or, or their local language. Um, and uh, the way we demonstrate there is, is very different because we go into the villages. We always have to talk to the chief when you come into the villages. You have to get the village elders around and discuss it. And then you have to get to the woman very, very different way because the women are always on the side in Mali. They'll ne if you go into a village, the woman will never be there. While in Kenya, the women are much more you know, strongly uh, represented. And you, know, you go in, the your first people you meet will probably be the women. Um, anyway, so yeah, the fundamentals of the model, like I say, we want to keep a very tight grasp on, okay, this is fundamentally what we do. These are the things that don't change. And then around the edges, you adapt for the culture. But it's going to be interesting going to you know, Asia and uh, Central America where I haven't spent any time in those places. So it might be really, really difficult. <laughs> yeah. Great. Well, um, yeah, thank you so much for coming.